Well, hello and welcome to this history happy hour on Rose O'Neill Greenow, socialite, secessionist, and spy. I'm Kelly Hancock, the public programs manager at the American Civil War Museum in Richmond, Virginia. And as I start out this talk, I wanna begin uh, with just a few questions. What motivates someone to risk everything for a cause? Is it strong passions? Is it a reckless nature, a longing for adventure or a desire for notoriety? And I think when we look at Rose O'Neill Greenow, all of these may have been motivating factors in her life. Now, this is the earliest known picture of Rose Greenow. Uh, here she is in her 30s. When she first came to Washington, D.C., though, she was about 15. Uh, this was in 1828. And Rose's widowed mother, Eliza, had sent her and her sister Ellen to live with their aunt, Mariah Hill, who was Eliza's sister. And Mariah ran a boarding house, it was called Hill's Boarding House, and it uh, was located in the old brick Capitol building. This is the building that the US Congress had used after the British burned uh, the uh, US Capitol in 1814. And then uh, the Hills acquired it, it became a boarding house. And they primarily catered to Southern politicians. Uh, and one of those was John C. Calhoun uh, from South Carolina. Rose uh, formed a lifelong friendship with Calhoun, as she did with many politicians in Washington, D.C., but Calhoun was among the closest. Rose stood out for her beauty. She had thick, long, dark hair, chestnut eyes, a pale olive complexion, a good figure, so she was a little curvaceous, and she was also flirtatious, uh, which uh, attracted many men to her, uh, including married men. Uh, their wives were not too happy about that. We don't know uh, really anything about Rose's education. Uh, presumably, uh, she had acquired one before she came to DC. And I, I will mention that uh, she came from Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, where her family owned a, a small plantation. Uh, Rose's eldest sister Susanna uh, had married a man from a prestigious family in Georgetown. Uh, so uh, when Rose and Ellen come to DC, uh, Susanna kind of provides entree into upper levels of DC society. And of course in the boarding house, uh, Rose is immersed in a world of politics. Within five years, uh, Rose's uh, sister Ellen married James Madison Cutts, who was a nephew of Dolly Madison. So this is uh, another uh, avenue into DC high society. Rose herself did not marry until May of 1835 when she was 30, or when she was 22 years old. She married Dr. Robert Greenhow. And I don't have a picture of Robert, but I can show you the church in which they were married, St. Patrick's Catholic Church. Now, Robert was not a uh, Catholic. He was an Episcopalian. Uh, Robert uh, has an interesting connection, uh, at least to me, because he was a Richmonder. He was born in Richmond. In fact, his mother was killed in uh, the tragic theater fire. Uh, Robert was educated at William and Mary and then uh, went to medical school in New York, but his true passion was culture and language. He spent seven years in Europe. He spoke Spanish, French, German, and Italian. So when he came back to the States, he uh, got a job working as a translator and a librarian in the uh, State Department in Washington, D.C., Robert was 13 years older than Rose, but they do seem to have had uh, this, this very close marriage, uh, really kind of a partnership. And, and Rose uh, very often is the one who is uh, kind of pushing them forward in society. They had a, a total of eight children, but tragically five of them died uh, 
quite young. So there are only uh, three girls that survived Rose. They were social climbers. A lot of this is due to Rose and her personality, but they were invited by Martin Van Buren to visit him in the White House. They had tea with Dolly Madison. They threw a party to honor the Supreme Court Chief Justice Roger B. Taney, and of course, uh, maintained this friendship, as I mentioned earlier, with John C. Calhoun. Robert became quite close to him as well. Rose was very much a uh, staunch Southerner and someone who believed in slavery. She unashamedly voiced opinions about the inferiority of, quote, the Negroes. Uh, she had no problems believing that she was far superior as a white person. She was very much a product of her culture. And uh, it, it could be that her father's death had also influenced her because her father, uh, who was a man who liked to drink and carouse, uh, one night was coming home very, very late, was thrown from his horse, and his enslaved body servant, a man named Jacob, was accused of finishing him off, of striking a, a blow to his head with a rock. Even though Jacob protested, uh, declared his innocence, he had gone for help, he hadn't fled, uh, but he was executed nonetheless. Rose herself gave credit to her view, for her views to John C. Calhoun. And uh, this is what she wrote. She said, I am a Southern woman born with revolutionary blood in my veins and my first crude ideas of state and federal matters received consistency and shape from the best and wisest man of the century, John C. Calhoun. And even before the war, Rose was involved in intrigues to aid the expansion of slavery. In the summer of 1849, uh, General Narcisco Lopez, who was a, um, Venezuelan revolutionary came to Robert and, and talked to him about this plan to invade Cuba, capture it, and give it to the United States so it could be admitted as a slave state. Robert told Rose about this. She was so intrigued that she arranged to have breakfast, one-on-one uh, -on -one breakfast with Lopez, and then uh, she reported all this to John C. Calhoun, who was very enthusiastic about this endeavor uh, President Taylor, though, uh, quashed the expedition. He felt like it violated neutrality. But I think that shows you a little bit about Rose and uh, just uh, how uh, she was very much involved in what her husband was doing, very much involved in, in trying to expand slavery. Rose, by the time of the Civil War, was a widow. Her marriage ended rather tragically and rather suddenly. Robert was off working as a law agent for the newly created U.S. Land Commission in San Francisco, California. When uh, he was coming home one day, he fell off a planked road. It was a drop of about six feet. He injured his leg and hip on February 17, 1854. Uh, didn't really think a lot about this. It didn't seem like an, a life-threatening injury, but within six weeks, he was dead from infection. So he died on March 27th. How Rose discovered this news is unknown. This is seven years before the telegram, seven years before Western Union. So she certainly didn't get the news instantly. It either came by letter or perhaps uh, she saw it in the newspaper. Here is an account uh, from the Nevada Journal, March 31st, uh, talking uh, about Robert's death. Rose, upon learning of her husband's death, made a trip out to San Francisco, and she actually ended up suing the city and being awarded $10,000 in damages. Additionally, the U.S. Congress gave her $42,000 as compensation for Robert's salaries and incidental expenses. Now, despite these large settlements, uh, that's you know, an estate of $52,000, uh, which should have been sufficient for her to live on for some time, uh, within three years, Rose was in dire financial straits. Uh, she did like to spend a lot. She, she loved to entertain on a grand scale, so that may have had something to do with it. She also may have made some very bad investments speculating on stocks. 
but she was forced to rely on her son-in-law for support. Her eldest daughter, uh, Florence, had married S. Treadwell Moore, who went out west and became a prosperous miner. Uh, he uh, assisted her financially, and Rose eventually moved into a house on West 16th Street near, uh, near the White House. Now, one of close, Rose's closest friends was James Buchanan. So her husband's death really didn't change her activity in society. And she used her influence to promote Buchanan's run for the presidency. Uh, she was delighted by his victory in 1856. And this allowed her access to the highest levels of DC society. In spite of the fact though, that Rose is this adamant supporter of uh, slavery and uh, the South, she entertained both Northerners and Southerners, and a number of prominent Northerners frequented her home. Uh, Colonel Erasmus Darwin Keyes, who was the secretary to Winfield Scott, Senator William Seward, who was uh, a New York senator and an abolitionist, also Joe jo Lane of Oregon, and Senator Henry Wilson of Massachusetts, who uh, was an ab abolitionist, abolitionist as well. And he was also a, um, a president of the Military Affairs Committee in the Senate. So he was in a powerful place, uh, not a handsome man. He was described as having a large paunch. Uh, he was also a married man, but it was rumored that he and Rose did have an affair. And in the National Archives, there are over a dozen letters from uh, what is supposed to have been or what is thought to have been Henry Wilson. They signed him with the, the letter H. Uh, in these letters, he expresses his love. He expresses his desire to be with her. He apologizes uh, when he's not able to come to her home. Uh, he doesn't reveal any nas national secrets in uh, these letters. Now, uh, I don't think it's a, a, a mystery uh, that Rose becomes a spy. So I'm getting a little ahead of the story, but I will mention that there's some question about why Wilson, uh, did she actually get information out of him that she then relayed to Confederates? Did she use his name simply to make her information sound more reliable? Or as Anne Blackman, Rose's biographer uh, argues, uh, was she trying to trap him because of his abolitionist views? I'll mention too that there are some historians who don't believe that these letters were written by Henry Wilson at all, and they attribute them to Horace White, who was a clerk in the War Department. So there's a, a bit of a mystery there. Now, as the election of 1860 approached, it looked like Rose was going to be in uh, this prime position. Uh, she was gonna be a good friend of the next president, it seemed. Uh, she was close to Joe Lane, who was being considered. She was also friendly with John C. Breckinridge, who became the candidate for the Southern Democrats and who was Buchanan's VP. And uh, Rose uh, was also the, the aunt of uh, Rose Adele Cutts, who had married Stephen Douglas. And of course, Stephen Douglas is the candidate for the Northern Democrats. Of course, none of that happens. Uh, Abraham Lincoln is elected and ends 30 years of Democrat rule in DC. Uh, Rose despised Lincoln. She referred to him as the beanpole and uh, was certainly unhappy about Lincoln's election. And it, not only did Abraham Lincoln's election uh, cause uh, or lead to the breakup of the Union as those deep South states secede um, after he uh, wins. But uh, the election divided Rose's family. Her niece, Addie Cutts, uh, and her husband, Stephen Douglas, to befriend Lincoln, even though prior uh, to Lincoln's election, Douglas was uh, one, of his, one of his rivals. Her son-in-law, S. Treadwell Moore, becomes a captain in the U.S. Army. And it's interesting, Moore actually asked Rose to help him. He wanted to be sent to Ohio to raise a regiment. And uh, he asked Rose to use her influence, and she did. She wrote to the Secretary of Treasury, Sam and Chase, and uh, Moore was able to do as he had hoped. 
Now, uh, Rose was recruited as a spy in the spring of 1861 by Captain Thomas Jordan. He was a West Pointer. He was quartermaster in the U.S. Army, and he uh, was planning to leave the Army and side with the Confederates. In fact, he ends up on General Beauregard's staff. He wanted to create a spy ring, and uh, he recruited Rose to do that and uh, then taught her a cipher. And so this is the cipher here in the National Archives. And he uh, coordinated with her for her messages to be sent uh, to his alias, which was Thomas Rayford. So Rose's home became a meeting place for secessionists. And one of them that I'll mention is Eugenia Phillips, just because I uh, find this intriguing. She was the wife of Philip Phillips, a, a former Alabama senator and uh, a lawyer. Uh, he had decided to stay in DC, but she's also the sister of Phoebe Yates Pember, who was the, one of the matrons at Chimborazo during the war. One other member of the spy ring was a 16 year old girl named Betty Duvall. And it's Betty uh, who actually is the one to deliver Rose's fateful message. Now, Rose on July 9th sent a message to General Beauregard via Betty Duvall uh, telling him that the Union Army in Northeastern Virginia was about to move. Beauregard sent General Donnellan to confirm this. And uh, then on July 16th, Rose uh, gave that confirmation. Uh, she said the march was scheduled for tonight. So Beauregard uh, automatically wired Jefferson Davis with this news. Uh, Jefferson Davis then was able to send Joseph Johnston from the Valley to reinforce Beauregard. Rose uh, was not uh, in the city when the Battle of Manassas Bull Run was fought on July 21st. She was actually in New York City. She had gone uh, to uh, take her daughter Leela to, uh, to board a steamer. She, she decided to send Leela, her middle daughter, her middle surviving daughter, I should say, out west to join Florence. And she kept with her only her youngest child, little Rose. But when Rose returned to the city, she saw this as a Confederate victory and a victory that the women had helped to achieve. She said, the Southern women of Washington are the cause of the defeat of the Grand Army. They are entitled to the laurels won by the brave defenders of our soil and institutions. They have told Beauregard when to strike. So that uh, really reveals how proud Rose was of what she had done. And she continued to send messages to Beauregard. She sent nine messages in all. One of them was a map of the defenses around DC. Uh, Rose also uh, was outspoken in her hatred of Lincoln and the Union cause. She was obviously pro-Confederate. So in this sense, she did nothing to kind of keep her identity hidden. She wasn't like Elizabeth Van Loo, uh, who, who kind of played the game. And because of that, her, nor her neighbors became very suspicious. They watched comings and goings from her home. Uh, so they reported her to the Assistant Secretary of War, Thomas Scott. And uh, Scott then called in Alan Pinkerton, who uh, was uh, kind of the head of security for McClellan's army and had run a detective agency. On August 23rd, Pinkerton arrested Rose as she returned home from a walk. And Rose and other members of the spy ring were jailed in her home. One of those was Eugenia Phillips. Um, there were some other women jailed there too. Of course, little Rose is there with her. So they're all uh, under this kind of house arrest. And throughout this, Rose continued to send out messages. Sometimes she bribed guards to get this done. Sometimes she used invisible ink. She claimed she wove tra tapestries with yarn that had colored coded, coded meanings. Now, I'm not sure if that is absolutely uh, accurate or not, but she did manage to keep getting 
messages out. And in the official records, Rose was charged with being a spy and quote, furnishing the insurgent generals with important information relative to the movements of the Union forces. Rose, uh, another thing that she did was to make use of the press. And she, uh, in November, had written a letter to Secretary of State William Seward. Remember, they were friends. And in this letter, she complained about her poor treatment. She kind of compared herself to Marie Antoinette, talked about how she was not even allowed to change her linens without there being a guard to watch her. And uh, Rose wrote it uh, that uh, her situation was uh, even worse, that there was a detective that stood sentinel at her open door at all times for seven days. I, with my little child, was placed absolutely at the mercy of men without character or responsibility. And Rose was able to smuggle a copy of this letter because Seward didn't respond to it. So Rose smuggled a copy of this letter out. Uh, friends were able to get it in the Richmond newspaper, the Richmond wig. And uh, the wig had a lot of uh, fun kind of making jabs at Seward and talking about his reaction uh, to this letter. The papers reported on Rose and, and the fact that she was continuing to get out information, which really made uh, Pinkerton even more frustrated. He had the windows of her house boarded up. He went in and made sure that there was uh, not a scrap of paper so she wouldn't have anything to write on. And uh, the, the papers, of course, are reporting on all this. And here is Harper's Weekly, January 18th, 1862. Uh, they report that, of course, she's been carrying on this secret correspondence with the enemy and that she was going to be sent to Fort Lafayette. Now, that's a bit incorrect. Uh, instead, Rose was sent to Old Capitol Prison. And here's a photograph of Rose with her daughter there. Now, Old Capitol Prison was uh, had been her aunt's boarding house. So it's interesting to think about this, that this uh, old Capitol prison was Rose's first home in DC and it becomes her last home. Now, the, by the time that she is placed in the prison, uh, this uh, place is run down, it's dirty. Initially, it had been used to house Confederate soldiers. Now it's a place for disloyal citizens, for spies, for blockade runners, for deserters. Rose was uh, placed in a room on the upper floor at the back that overlooked the courtyard. Bars were placed over her windows. And uh, throughout this, Rose uh, responds in a very hostile, imperious, theatrical manner. Uh, she treats the guards as if they're servants. She looks down on the other prisoners. Uh, she does everything uh, to aggravate them. So uh, as a result of that, uh, the US officers who are uh, overseeing the prison uh, don't, uh, you know, don't take kindly to this. So they do uh, give out passes to people who want to come see the famous spy. Uh, Matthew Brady or one of his photographers was allowed to come in and uh, take pictures of her. So this photograph and then this other one right here, which is was very similar. So this kind of thing happens. Now, Lincoln really wants to eliminate the crowding in the Southern prisons, and his desire is to exile a lot of these, these pro-South people, especially women, uh, to exile them to the South. So he had created a two-man U.S. commission relating to state prisoners. John A. Dix was one of uh, those on the commission. He was a good friend of Rose's, so he came to visit her on March 17th, and um, told her basically if she would refrain from theatrics and insults, uh, he would see that she was quietly released. But that's not what Rose wanted. Rose wanted justice and she demanded that. So she ended up coming before the commission for a hearing. The other member of the commission was Edwards Pierpont, a New York Superior Court judge. And Pierpont and Dix had been releasing a stream of prisoners on the condition that they take the oath of allegiance or a parole of honor to, uh, to keep out of the fight and refrain from providing aid or comfort to the enemy. So it was pretty simple. And uh, Pierpont made it clear to Rose that that was what Lincoln wanted. Uh, he has said it has been proposed that we make this suggestion to you and see if you would like to accept it. 
And you would think that after being imprisoned for seven months, Rose would be ready to take this offer, but no, she was not ready to back down. And she said, in other words, you mean to tell me that if I do not accept it, I will be forcibly exiled. And that's what she wanted to make the Lincoln government do, to forcibly send her south. And she said, it is exiling me to use any force to send me south from my home. So then the commissioners proceeded to question her and they asked her about the cipher that had been found in her home. And she uh, said she had never used it. They asked her about letters that uh, she had, in which she had support, reported troop numbers. And she said she didn't recall them. She wouldn't swear it, but she thought that they were false. She said she was not accountable for her guest. And uh, then uh, she gives this, this very intriguing statement. She says, if Mr. Lincoln's friends shall pour into my ear such important information, am I to be held responsible for all that? Could it be presumed that I could not use that which was given to me by others? If I do not, I would be unjust to myself and my friends. It is said that a woman cannot keep a secret. I am a woman and a woman usually tells all she knows. Uh, well, uh, after a while, the commission uh, decided, okay, we'll just send her back to old Capitol prison. So she went back to the prison. And then on April 3rd, Rose received word that the commission would exile her. So she wrote to the uh, governor, uh, military governor, General Woodson, and said, okay, I will accept banishment under protest, but I won't promise that I'll stay gone for the entire world war. I might come back before that. And then she asked for clemency time and freedom to make the necessary arrangements, adding, of course, if this is granted me, I shall bind myself for the period of time allotted not to blow up the president's house, equip a fleet, break open the treasury, or do any other small act, which you may suppose comes within my limited power to perform it. Well, that uh, certainly did not please the military governor. So he just ignored it. And then finally, Rose uh, got tired of waiting. So on April 14th, she said, sir, I am ready to leave the prison to go south according to the decree of the commissioners to that effect. So she acquiesced. And uh, by this point, I think the government was a little tired of dealing with her. So they thought, all right, we'll just let her sit there for a while. And she was not freed until May 31st at uh, two o'clock. So uh, by that point, she was then sent uh, via flag of truce boat uh, to Norfolk and then, uh, well, actually then on to City Point and then by rail, she came from Petersburg up to Richmond and it was Rose, Little Rose. And there was also another prisoner uh, who was released with her. She had been imprisoned for 10 months, five in her house and then over four in Old Capitol Prison. Now, when Rose arrived in Richmond, it was on June 4th. It was right after the Battle of Seven Pines, the, the first um, the battle right outside of Richmond as, as McClellan had gotten almost to the gates of the city bringing his massive army up the Virginia Peninsula. So the city was you know, filling up with wounded. So it's in, in this environment that Rose arrives. Jefferson Davis did come to visit her. And according to Rose in her book, she said that Davis uh, told her, but for you, there would have been no battle of Bull Run. Now, whether he actually said it like that or not, uh, who knows, he certainly did give her credit. He did appreciate her service. In fact, he had Judah Benjamin pull $2,500 from the Secret Service Fund for Rose as an acknowledgement of the valuable and patriotic service rendered uh, to you by our cause. No, by you to our cause. There we go. So he was grateful for that. He also wrote to Verena and uh, told her the madam looks much changed and has an air of one whose nerves were shaken by mental torture. Rose spent about a year in Richmond and there's very little information on what she did while she was here. Uh, Mary Chestnut uh, kind of gives the indication that uh, there was a, a lot of gossip about Rose 
that uh, the way she had acquired information in DC through affairs, through sexual favors, uh, was really looked down upon. So the women in Richmond, uh, it doesn't appear kind of greeted her with open arms. Now it's thought that Rose spent most of the time uh, that she was in Richmond shaping the journal that she had kept as a prisoner, shaping that into a, into a book. And then Jefferson Davis, uh, kind of as a last ditch effort in an attempt to get recognition, uh, decided that Rose might make a pretty good emissary, that if he sent her over to Europe, maybe she could do something that the Confederate commissioners uh, had not been able to accomplish. So Rose left uh, for Europe on August 5th, 1863, uh, left out of the, the port of Wilmington, North Carolina. She brought little Rose with her. And on the blockade runner, she also brought with her 540 bales of cotton, uh, this from the Confederate government. This cotton was to be used as white gold to pay for her expenses while she was in Europe. And she spent about a year in Europe um, a lot of time spent in London, but also time in uh, Paris as well. And during this year, she signs a contract with Richard Bentley, who was publisher in ordinary to her majesty and uh, had her book, My Imprisonment in the First Year of Abolition Rule at Washington uh, printed. And that took about three months. Rose, uh, while she was in uh, England, uh, arranged the release for a naval officer who had been uh, taken uh, from the Alabama. Uh, she worked with Charles Francis Adams, who was the US minister to the court of St. James to get that accomplished. She uh, decided to put Little Rose in, uh, in a convent, the Convent du Sacre Coeur in Paris, uh, which is now the Rodin Museum, Musée Rodin. In, uh, so if you've been there uh, to, to look at Rodin's masterpieces, you have uh, been where Little Rose spent some time. One thing that Rose was able to arrange was a meeting with Napoleon III. And this is probably, Anne Blackman makes a, a big point of this in her book, that this is probably the first time that the French emperor agreed to see an American-born woman for a policy talk. Uh, this is an unusual role for a woman at the time. And here she is meeting with the emperor. She definitely used flattery on him. She tried uh, to persuade him to recognize the Confederacy, but Napoleon questioned the South's military strategy. And he also uh, did not want to act unilaterally. He, he would not act unless Great Britain did. And Rose did not have any success in convincing Lord Palmerston, who was the prime minister and head of a liberal government that opposed slavery. Uh, she did not have any success in convincing uh, Palmerston to do that. She thought about going to Rome and trying to get papal recognition and then finally decided against that. So on July 30th, she uh, went to Paris one last time to, to talk uh, uh, to Little Rose and to say goodbye to her because she had decided to return to uh, the Confederacy. And she wrote that the desperate struggle in which my people are engaged is ever present. And I long to be near to share in the triumph or to be buried under the ruins without home, without nationality. So on August 10th, Rose boarded the Condor, which was a sleek, fast blockade runner. It left out of uh, the Scottish port of Greenock, and then uh, went to Bermuda, then Halifax, and the goal was to make it back to Wilmington. The ship was captained by William Nathan Wright Hewitt, who was a British naval officer on furlough. Rose on, or the ship, on Saturday, October 1st, 1864, about 3 a.m., uh, the Condor encountered blockade runners off the coast, or blockaders, off the coast of Fort Fisher. And one of those blockaders was the USS Niffon. The Niffon fired a broadside at the Condor, but missed. And the Condor, seeing a ship ahead and, and thinking it was another blockader, uh, swerved to miss it. And Captain Wright ran the ship aground upon a shoal. Uh, the ship that Wright saw 
had actually been the wreck of another blockade runner. Now, the ship is in this position where it's stuck on the shoal, but it was protected by the guns of Fort Fisher. So Captain Wright was not altogether worried. He felt like he would be able to, uh, once the tide kind of came in and would raise the Niffon, that he would be able to get uh, the Condor into port and in, into Wilmington. But Rose was panicked. Uh, she was terrified that she was going to be captured again. She had already spent almost 10 months in prison. She did not want that to happen. And of course, uh, she was a persuasive woman. She was a woman who typically got her way. And in this uh, instance, it did not work well for her. The captain agreed to lower a uh, boat. He sent uh, a pilot and a couple of crewmen uh, with uh, the boat, in addition to Lieutenant Wilson, who was the officer that Rose had negotiated for his release, uh, and then uh, Judge Holcomb, who was a Confederate commissioner to Canada. So they were all lowered into the sea, and about the time, almost instantly, when the boat hit the ocean, there was a big swell that came up and capsized it. Now, everyone except Rose was able to make it back to the boat. Rose wasn't. And I think if you look at this picture of her, you get one idea. Uh, part of the, the fact, uh, part of the problem was her clothing. She's wearing a very heavy, heavy dress. Uh, so that weighted her down. And in addition to this, she had a pouch with dispatches uh, for, uh, from the commissioners, Mason and Slidell, for Judah Benjamin. And also in that pouch, she had 400 gold sovereigns. Uh, that was the equivalent of about $2,000 at the time. These co uh, coins probably weighed around six pounds. And this pouch is uh, attached to Rose's neck by a chain. So she's weighted down uh, with that gold. And because of that, was unable to make it back to the ship. Now, her body was discovered a few hours later by a Confederate century. Uh, he is said to be the shortest man with the longest name in the Confederate Army. His name was J.J. Prosper for me, D. Dr. Duval O'Connor. O'Connor evidently uh, found the body, saw this pouch, looked inside it, saw all the gold and buried it uh, because that's what you do when you find a treasure. He had planned to go back later and uh, you know, get it for himself, but there are two reasons or two stories about why he didn't. One says that he just got afraid uh, that he would be discovered, so he unburied it and reported it to his commanding officer. The other story is that when he found out who the body was, who the woman was, that she was a heroine of the Confederacy and was bringing the money, uh, he decided uh, to, to turn that in. But regardless of that, uh, the money does end up being turned in and it's Thomas Taylor who was supervising the salvage of the Nighthawk. That was the other uh, blockade runner that had run aground uh, or had wrecked. Thomas Taylor is the one that discovered Rose's body on the beach. And uh, he, in uh, writing about this, said, a remarkably handsome woman she was with features which showed much character. Rose's body was taken to hospital number four. There was an honor guard stationed at the door. People came by to view uh, or to pay their respects to Rose. There was a mass held for her at St. Thomas, the Apostle Roman Catholic Church. And uh, then she was buried at Oakdale Cemetery. And in 1888, the Ladies Memorial Association erected a marble cross at uh, her grave. So uh, there we have it. So if we think about Rose as a spy, uh, she did that great service before the Battle of Manassas Bull Run. Uh, Beauregard did, uh, when he wrote about this years later, mentioned that he had other, had that same information from other sources, but the, uh, so it, she wasn't the only source of information, but she did help to confirm and confirm when this movement was going to take place. So that was valuable information. 
But as far as a spy, uh, she was very, uh, very open about her beliefs and what she did. So she wasn't as effective as she could have been. But where she was effective was in the PR department. She was able to, to generate a lot of uh, sympathy, a lot of uh, support. And even in Great, uh, in Great Britain and in France, uh, there, were, there were people that truly admired her. Uh, she didn't uh, succeed in getting recognition for the Confederacy, probably couldn't have, but she was, uh, you know, this was at least uh, a possibility perhaps for the uh, Confederates with her. Uh, so uh, there you have it. I did have a few questions that came in. Uh, one was about the Rose and the Jackal, uh, whether that was accurate. And I have to say, I've never seen it, so I cannot speak to that. Uh, there is a question about Little Rose and uh, what happened to her. She did end up coming back to the States after the, uh, after the war ended. She went on to marry a, a man who was a, a West Point graduate and an officer in the U.S. Army, even though they did eventually uh, get divorced. And I believe she had one child. There was a question about what happened to uh, the, the men who had provided Rose with information. Uh, as far as Wilson went, Henry Wilson, uh, there were no repercussions for him, even though they did find all those love letters in uh, Rose's house and, and, and knew that he was connected to Rose. Uh, Wilson continued to serve on the military as chair of the Military Affairs uh, Committee. And in 1872, he becomes General Grant's or President Grant's vice president. Uh, so nothing really happened to him. Uh, when Pinkerton was spying on Rose, there was a, uh, a military officer that uh, Pinkerton ended up following, and then the officer had Pinkerton arrested. Uh, Pinkerton then was able to smuggle out a note, and uh, in the end, this officer, uh, who is not named, was arrested. So there were, there were some, uh, some people involved uh, who were arrested. Uh, and a lot of the women in the spy ring uh, ended up being exiled like Rose or taking those uh, paroles of honor. Well, thank you for joining me for this history happy hour on Rose O'Neill Greenow. And as always, if, uh, if you're interested in our other programs that we have coming up, please visit our website at acwm.org. Thank you for watching.